Hello. I'm Robert Thompson. Chinese and friendly. Welcome to the Annex. We're just setting up for a small neighborhood lane party. Having gatherings like this and even our own fall fair are some of the ways that we have fun as a neighborhood. Actually, we think of ourselves as a bit of a village in downtown Toronto. A village? And the Annex was a village until 1887 when we were annexed by the city of Toronto. I get it. Mark Kidd. Thanks. While Michael continues to provide inspirational music for people working, Ethan and I are going to show you around the Annex and have you meet some of the people that make our neighborhood special. I've lived in the Annex for eight years, but Ethan was raised here and he can sniff out each special event that is taking place. Within the commercial boundaries of the Annex, which extend from Bloor Street to DuPont, Avenue Road to Bathurst, we have preserved the feeling of an urban village in the heart of downtown Toronto. You see, people who live in a large city can't inhabit it as a whole. Home becomes a neighborhood, a place to preserve, to care for, and to have fun in. Loney Webster has lived here for 14 years. We here on Street School annual fun fair, which we do every year to raise a little money for the school, but the main intent is for the community to get together and have a really good spring day. And parents and teachers have worked very hard to bring in things to sell, books, clothes, and it's just a typical family day here in the Annex. Even the local police get into the spirit and change into country and western singers providing an upbeat backdrop to the fair. Why do you like living in here? Well, I think the thing that makes the annex a special neighborhood and uh -huh. community is mainly the people that live in it. There are a lot of ethnic groups that live in the annex. Um, it's a very multicultural community. Um, and most of the people are very interested. All the filmmakers and the writers and the university professors and the students and the right. part-time people and the new immigrants. <laughs> Heterogeneous is what it's called. Heterogeneous. Imagine how boring it would be if we're all the same. That's just it. There are many different people. I mean, you're different. You're different? No, I'm the same. <laughs> In any of the boundaries of the Annex, one has access to activities that range from theater to the local Y to dance. The dance makers are an Annex-based group known for their unorthodox interpretations in modern dance. that's always sharp. The Wilkinson Sword self-sharpening knife. It's sharp every time you need it. Because every time you remove it from the protective case, the built-in sharpener sharpens the stainless steel blade. The Wilkinson Sword self-sharpening knife. Several popular sizes. One will become your favorite knife. Case closed. From Wilkinson Sword. What's the problem, Fran? Which steam carpet cleaner should I rent? No problem. It's got to be Rug Doctor with the vibrating brush. The other ones have a little wand you scrub with or one that pity packs your carpet with its little bar. There's only one Rug Doctor. Steaming mad at dirt. Now that's what I call deep down clean. There is only one Rug Doctor. Consult your yellow pages for the nearest rental location. it affords me a way of life that I agree with in a way. I was very much influenced by the, uh, the Toronto City planning that went on in the late 60s and 70s with uh, Crombie and Sewell based on the Jane Jacobs sort of idea that you 
renew the interiors of your cities, you don't let them decay, that you encourage neighborhoods and a quality of living within a city that, well, yeah. is what I call civilized. The residents in the annex take part in their democracy, so to speak. As the world and the city change about them, they study and debate the pros and cons of these changes, and then they speak up. They fight for parks. They fight for freedom from high-rises and heavy traffic. Ron Cantor lives here and represents the annex on city council. He's been the alderman for Ward 5 for three years and was an active member of the Annex Residents Association. The Annex Residents Association is one of the very first in the city of Toronto. It was established in 1928 or 1930, and it has dealt with a variety of, of, of threats to, to uh, uh, living in the area. Uh, the two biggest ones, I think, are our uh, expressways. Uh, there was a proposal, of course, to build the, uh, the infamous Spadina Expressway, which would have cut right through the heart of the neighborhood. Fifteen years ago, an area considered civilized was nearly ruined. Thousands of concerned citizens dug into their pockets to hire the lawyers to fight their own government. And this was the fight against the Spadina Expressway. They won. The Church of St. Alban the Martyr. Right now, I am deep in the heart of the annex. At the turn of the century, it was thought that this was going to be the new center of the whole city. With the uncontrolled industrializing of Toronto, the wealthy upper classes were moving away from Jarvis and Wellington and Church Street and coming here to the suburbs. So much so that Bishop Sweatman was determined that the Anglican Cathedral would move as well. Unfortunately, there were two things he couldn't foresee. First, the Depression, and secondly, that his wealthy flock would fly away even further north to Forest Hill and Rosedale. So this unique 13th century Gothic architecture remains uncompleted. In the 1880s, the annex was virtually farmland. By 1887, S.H. Jane, a real estate promoter, had laid out the first streets in the annex and by the turn of the century, the rich, including the Eatons and the Goodrums, were firmly entrenched in their annex mansions. Until 1929, the area was still a dense enclave of rich Anglican families, but after the stock market crash, many of the merchant princes moved further north. However, many of the first families were not tempted by the richer pastures. They loved the annex, and they stayed on. The space left by those who moved to Rosedale and Forest Hill was quickly filled by other ethnic groups, predominantly Jewish. One young Jewish couple was Bessie and Harry Finkelstein. Thirty-year-old Bessie remained optimistic when told that she could never grow a garden in the slums of the West Annex. It was really not, uh, not a nice-looking uh, street, but I didn't have money, and I, it was all right for me, and I said, I'll fix it up, and I did. Now, 74-year-old Bessie has a garden which she grew using most innovative methods. But when I came, like I told you, I went and I uh, wanted manure and I ran on the road to get when the horse made something. Uh, and I went with the shovel to get the manure. And then when I started, my neighbor, she said she made a farm out of this house. So then after she see my farm going nice, so she ran on the road to get <laughs> and this was to it. I love gardening, and I, you could see how much time I put in. There was nothing in here. After the Second World War, most of the Jewish community also moved north of the annex to the suburbs, which held greater appeal. And by the late 50s and early 60s, the new Canadians flooded in. They came from Hungary and from Italy and Greece. They opened small stores and restaurants on Bloor Street West and changed the complexion of the entire area, giving it a European texture. Many made the annex their home, and to help finance the mortgages of their new houses, they rented out rooms to students from the nearby University of Toronto. The era of rooming houses had begun. The annex has always had a strong relationship with the university. Much of its intellectual grit comes from the professors who live here, university researchers 
such as Dr. Fred Banting, one of the discoverers of insulin, added a little notoriety. However, by the mid-60s, these academics were augmented by newer professionals. One of those professionals was a young lawyer who still lives in the annex. This is the house of Clayton Ruby, who I am told is one of Canada's leading criminal lawyers. here now for, oh, for 18 years. And what was the condition of the house like when you first moved in? It was really not much like this. Um, we opened it up an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And changed it quite a bit, I think, in light of that. This really is beautiful. Thank Have you had to do a lot of work on it? Yes. Uh, fortunately, we did it back when I could afford to do it. I'm not sure mm -hmm. I could do it today. Why did you decide to first come to the annex to live? I was renting in the annex uh, and a law student, and every day I used to walk to school past this house, and I just fell in love with it. Do you think the annex has changed much since you first came here? It's changed and it's not changed. Um, if you look at the character of the annex, the, the character of the buildings have been preserved. It hasn't changed. Um, they've kept large developments out. For the most part, developments that are out of character with the community as it is out. On the other hand, um, there's more people who own their own houses here now. In the 60s, there were speed freaks living next door. And uh, loud parties and police raids every other night. That sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. Today, the newest additions to the annex are West Indians, East Indians, and Irani. They are drawn to the area because of its proximity to downtown, where most of them work, and to the multicultural nature of the annex. Ratna Omidvar and her family escaped from Iran three years ago and came here to live. It's been like a home here now for many years. When I first came from Iran, I was so lonely and so uprooted and so isolated that it was really important for me and my family to find a place where we felt home. And that meant somewhere where the neighbors were friendly, where there were trees on the street, where people talked to you beyond the mere, hello, how are you kind of thing. I don't feel alone. I feel I've put down my roots here, and I belong here. As the new ethnic groups came to the neighborhood, they brought with them their own unique cultures that added a greater dimension to the area. The West Indians' drive for a better life has given a different energy to the Yannick. However, their high hopes didn't prepare them for some of the realities of their new home. Contrast is a newspaper that serves the West Indian and black community across Canada. Dan Jolly, the publisher of Contrast, explains why the paper is based in the annex. Well, I think when the paper was founded 16 years ago, as you mentioned, there's this milieu of people, mainly because it is sort of the starting point for most immigrants. Like many of its early readers, Contrast is firmly established. However, it still serves a definite function for the new immigrants. Most people migrate to improve their lot in life. And therefore, that is their main focus. They're not concerned about any distractions. They have mostly a single sense of purpose. They want to make some money, they want to buy a house, and they want the good life for which they came. They don't want to be distracted, and at the same time, they feel it might impede their progress to get involved, to rock the boat, so to speak. Is that part of your function, to get them going? Yeah, a part of our function is to educate them and to orient them to the new, the new way of life and make them aware that, in fact, the political route is one of the ways to improve your life more decidedly. Don't take off too much, please. Okay. While Carl of La Parisienne Hairdressing Salon carefully trims Ethan's hair, I'll check the air in our tires once again. Oh, Full of great entertainment, and it's all on the TTC. We got shows to see, our symphony, art and ice, even winter's nice. A museum grand, dancing to a band. We've got sights to see, all on the TTC. We got movie screens, our hockey team, castle on a hill and skating trails, door to lower nights out and more. We've got sights to see, all on the TTC. Toronto's Entertainment Network. A different frontier. 
not up in space, but three miles below the surface, searching for something few can find. Because of their continuous advances in exploration technology, Shell Canada has long been this country's leading producer of natural gas. Shell Canada, putting technology and people to work. Don't let rust turn your car or truck into worthless scrap. Control rust with Rust Check. Just as you tune your car's engine, you should annually rust proof its body. Rust Check is a safe, clean liquid that checks rust on new and used cars. And Rust Check is the only national rust protection program recommended by the Automobile Protection Association. Service the engine. Rust Check the body. Here's your insured warranty. The Rust Check really works. You know, Nancy, our gaily production manager. Well, look at what she's produced now. Yes, a new addition to the Gay Lee family. Before long, Nancy will be back, giving cream-rich milk that the Gay Lee people churn into farm fresh butter. Taste the difference Gay Lee butter can make. Your family will love that special flavor. Gay Lee, quite simply, better butter. What shall we call her? Nancy Lee. <laughs> Well, Ethan, this is one of Toronto's most vulnerable, no, venerable <laughs> drinking establishments. You want to risk the morality squad and come in for a beer? Ah, uh, afraid I can't. Um, they don't allow kids my age in. Say no more. Well, I've got my own place to go. Oh. Tell me about it later. <laughs> Brunswick House is one of the oldest drinking establishments of Toronto. People have been drinking beer here for over a hundred years. Nightly entertainment at the tavern varies from the conventional to the bizarre. This evening, if you can believe it, an excerpt from the Threepenny Opera, accompanied by the tavern's own Diamond Lil. For 40 years, Diamond Lil has been a singing waitress here. One of the genuine celebrities of the annex, or the the Brunswick and the whole part of the, the fringe that makes the annex such an exciting place. Tell me, why do you think that you are a celebrity? Here? Yeah. Well, I guess because I'm one of the first women to ever work in the bevy room. It always used to be men waiters. Right. Myself and another girl, Phyllis, the worked days and I worked nights. We were the first two women to come in here. I think I know everybody. I was born on Augusta, lived a major in Harvard, live in Cot, Concord. So you've got your regulars, you've got your oh, people yeah, we returning got the game. We've got a lot of new ones. Every September we get a new crew from UT, eh? Right. And uh, lots of fun training them, but they're great kids. People have been drinking beer here since 1876, yeah. is that right? Yeah. That's, That's a sure. fine tradition. Sure. And a lot of them have hung out here right until their dying day. <laughs> and uh, like we say jokingly, some have passed out the doors and some have really passed out. <laughs> <laughs> south of the annex is exciting, colorful, and yet comfortable. There are restaurants and outdoor cafes where people can relax, eat anything from falafels and French pastries to plain hamburgers, or just sit back and watch. popular bookstores of the Strip is Book City. Books? Ah, probably where Ethan is. His mother says he's going through an intellectual phase. Excuse me, friend. Um, I'm looking for a book by John Winham called The Crystallion. I think we just got it in again. Hold on a second. I'll check for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess it is the general ambiance of Book City that has kept me coming here ever since I was nine. This bookstore presents a feeling of relaxation. 
back together with the general kindness of the people that work here make browsing through the bookshelves quite enjoyable. There are, though, certain characteristics that are rarely found in a bookstore. There are the unusually late hours, which Book City keeps. And, of course, there's the generally good selection of books, which Book City is known. Okay, I got your book here, Eaton. Oh, thank Did you. Did you realize that it was first published in 1903? 1903 is yeah. something I didn't know. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Um, listen, I'm a big fan of Book City. Can I ask you a few questions? Go ahead. How long has Book City been opened? We have been open nine years. Nine this years? This year, actually. Nine years this September. Why do you keep such late hours? Well, an honest answer is uh, because I need the bucks. <laughs> you know, I need those sales. But uh, to be quite true, it is, it's an exciting area. It's always very busy. Uh, a lot of people browse around after they've had dinner. And uh, I have found that uh, book selling is some sort of entertainment. It's not just a business that you shut at, at 5 o'clock. Most of our customers actually uh, come into the store after 5 o'clock, uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, and it's, uh, mm. it's very dead here, and uh, hardly anybody. However, that's never been the case down the street at Honest Ed's. Forty-three years ago, Ed Mervish opened Toronto's largest discount store. The store boasted of incredible bargains and attracted the old, the young, and the plain adventurous who didn't mind being trampled in search of bargains. Today, although Ed Mervish owns many businesses all over Toronto, the focus of his expansion is south of the Annex. We called it Honest Ed's because it was so ridiculous. And, and we painted the whole front white. In fact, one day, I painted the front of the house white. You still may be able to see it through the iron grids there. And I said, if these prices don't suit you, what do you want, blood? And I put a big drop of blood at the top of the building and all down the white building and across the sidewalk. And my wife was passing the next day on the other side of the street, and she got sick. She said, this has got to go. You know, it was bad taste. I realized it afterwards. So the next day, I had to paint it out. So it's nice to have my wife around to keep me on an even level, you know, because otherwise I can go out too far. Honest Dead is for the birds. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Honest Dead is a freak. Bargains come out of my ears. Honest Dead saves you nothing. But money, honest. Fifty years ago, this was a, a very Jewish neighborhood. Today, it's one of the most interesting, exciting areas in the whole world. If my wife would let me, I'd move upstairs uh, of the store. But she says we got to stay a little north. I'm not officially in the annex right now. The annexers are quite sticky about that. The annex ends at Bloor. I'm actually in a part of a strip that runs around the annex, and this is uh, Mervish land. We have David Mervish books. We have honest Eds. You see, Torontonians get to be thankful for Ed, for the, the Royal Alec and honest Eds, and the uh, British get to be thankful for Ed, for the Old Vic. In fact, we're in Mervish Village. Development of this kind is, is bound to happen in any city that has vitality. The only question is, uh, can it be done with taste? The residents' associations of Seton Village and the Annex have been eyeing Ed's expansions for some time now, and I gather that they've reached a compromise with Ed about his new sign. It's 30 feet high and 600 feet long, and it flashes. But thanks to the Residents Associations, it's not going to flash all night. And Ed does assure us that uh, he's been given an award for conserving electricity. Dazzlingly bright, <laughs> but Ed is uh, as generous as ever, and his sign is bigger than ever. Have some food. Oh, thank you very much. He says he's been given an award. An award for what? Conserving electricity. <laughs> How you doing? Hi, Delise. Hi. Where was it? Oh, right here. A place okay. reserved. Why, thank you. Have you had some Hello, chicken Robert. yet? 
chicken? No, I haven't chicken. had chicken. Oh, very good. What's this? Wonderful. Steak, I think. Whose is it? Well, we are going to leave you now because, frankly, I'm starving. After all, Ethan and I have peddled 40-odd blocks of the annex. Hope you've enjoyed our look at the neighborhood. So, drop in any time. There's always something going on.